Liberty Nation with Tim Donner. And now we have inexorably reached the portion of Liberty Nation Radio, which contains the very name of the show within the segment. It's called Talking Liberty when we're rejoined by our regular contributor, constitutional lawyer, and LibertyNation.com legal affairs editor, Scott Cosenza. Hello, Scott. It's everybody's favorite segment of the show, Tim. I love doing it. Pleasure to be here. You might consider not saying that every week in your introduction, (laughs) but then we can take that offline at some point. Let's talk impeachment briefly, and then we're going to get to the real meat of the matter, which is your own experience in the midst of this growing crisis about guns in Virginia. So let, let me just get, as a constitutional lawyer, let me get your thoughts as you watched the Senate trial. Well, the big takeaway for me, Tim, was the repeated use by uh, Mr. Schiff and Mr. Schumer of the, the language of uh, a criminal trial in America, due process and the right to a fair trial. But they turn the notion on its head, Tim, because it's not a fair trial for the accused that they're talking about, which is how it works in American jurisprudence. Our Constitution, uh, (laughs) through numerous provisions in it and its Bill of Rights, give those who are accused of crimes uh, certain rights, like the right to a speedy trial, for instance, the right to a jury trial, for instance. These are not rights that the state has. Or, or, or that the government has. So those people just keep talking about fair trial, fair trial, but it's for them. They want the fairness. Chuck Schumer needs fairness, not Donald Trump. And I think it's Orwellian, and it, it, um, it contributes to both ignorance for people on what actual rights they have against the state and for this process as well. Well, you, gr- you wrote a great piece to that effect on LibertyNation.com this week about how, you know, the right— to a speedy trial, the right to a fair trial exists for the accused, not for the accuser, and yet they're turning it on on its head. You know, Scott, in reading that, it reminded me of hearing uh, various sermons in church where I came away from it saying, you know, I knew that scripture and I knew what it meant, but hearing it put that way was a real wake-up call. And I think, you know, you've, you've pointed out the fundamental thing. And now we can move on to the issue of guns and Virginia, you were right in the mix of thousands of people showing up in Richmond to dispute the gun-grabbing policies that are being promoted by the Democratic Party in Virginia. Just share with us the highlights of your experience. <clears throat> well, Tim, the, the legacy media is still waiting for violence to occur in Richmond, still shocked <laughs> that there wasn't massive amounts of violence because of all these gun owners who often had guns with them on in the streets of Richmond to say to the Democrats, don't take our guns away. Um, you know, I, I happened to see a couple that I knew uh, while I was there, a Jewish man and his black female wife. And it's like, you know, where's the Klan rally, Tim? Um, yeah. It was a big lie that this was some kind of like revisiting of Charlottesville Unite the Right rally. It wasn't. It was Virginians in mass saying just because Democrats won a majority in the legislature doesn't mean that that gave them a blank check on taking Virginians' gun rights away. What was the sense you got, Scott, of the, I think it was reported that 22,000 people showed up. Did you get a sense of how many of these people have been uh, were longtime gun rights activists, and how many of them were emboldened by the uh, aggressive measures of the Democratic uh, leaders in both the legislature and the governor? Well, they have been doing this. Uh, one of the other misinformation pieces is that this is somehow like a new uh, event. It's called Lobby Day. Uh, and it takes place every year uh, on Martin Luther King Jr. Hol- uh, holiday. And it's, it's, it's over a decade old in terms of the gun rights groups that are going down there to lobby their legislatures, um, legislators, excuse me. Uh, I talked to lots and lots of folks, Tim, and a few of them had been there before, but the numbers are so outsized. It's an infinitesimal number that usually go, a couple thousand maybe, right? Hundreds, if you're, you know, hundreds to a thousand. As you said, I I heard that crowd estimate, too. I don't know how they come up with those estimates. I can tell you, though, with the exception of the Capitol lawn area that Governor Northam had walled off from the people, 
the rest of the streets around it were packed full of people. I mean packed full of people. So how has the left and the uh, the person, so to speak, of the Democratic Party of Virginia responded to this outpouring, which has to be a wake-up call for them if they're paying attention or care? What's been the response to this outpouring of support for a basic constitutional right, the second one listed in the Bill of Rights? Well, we're going to have to wait a little while to see, but the the, the immediate uh, outcome is nothing at all. The Virginia Senate uh, passed this week um, the red flag law, and we're waiting to see what action the House uh, side will take on that bill. That's the bill, Tim, that allows a police officer or a prosecuting attorney in Virginia to go to court and tell a judge that somebody's crazy or dangerous and get that judge to sign a warrant for them to lose their gun rights unless and until they prove that they can uh, they can convince that judge that they're not dangerous or crazy. Uh, the stripping of all due process, uh, we would call traditional notions of due process uh, where a right is concerned. What about the plans which were either leaked or maybe officially released, I'm not sure, about the governor's plan to fund and appoint a force of at least 13 individuals who would be, in effect, gun police, whose job would be to go and confiscate the guns that had now been uh, made illegal and not grandfathered in. Well, I, I think that's a that's not a big part of the story, only because it's new laws that we're concerned about that, that steal liberty from the people, uh, not necessarily new agents to steal the liberty that's already been removed. You know, that'll come either way. Uh, it, it's it's the it's the gun grabbing itself that that is the problem. All right, let's move south to Kentucky, where a lawmaker, that's what the media calls a politician, wants to give police the power to detain people who don't answer their questions. Uh, there seems something a little bit wrong with <laughs> with that notion. Just a little, Scott. just a little bit, Tim. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's. I, I always think that. I, I, I'm trying to remember the first time I ever heard a legislator say, well, the courts will fix it if it's wrong. In other words, like we're not going to have we don't have to worry about whether this legislation passes constitutional muster. It either will or it won't in the courts. And I, I wanted to bring this to the table because it's outrageous um, and, and, and people hopefully should be mindful of it. And and Senator Stephen Meredith uh, and his attempt to basically trample on on the rights just to be free in Kentucky, okay, and not have to engage with law enforcement personnel by giving them your information for no particular reason. You know, it's like, oh, they don't like the cut of your jib, so right. they're going to, you know, jack you up. Uh, and I just think it's always incumbent upon all members of government to always try to make sure that our constitutional rights are upheld. And so... That's what uh, should be the fate of this law, is that the fellow legislators should say, it doesn't matter if it'd be a good idea or would help law enforcement, it's a clear violation of constitutional rights and should be dismissed. But Virginia's not the only place where legislators are uh, trying to, to, to seize the people's liberty, Tim. Well, you know, the element of this that you discussed first about let's go ahead and pass the law and the courts will decide you know, whether it's actually constitutional or not reminds me of what happened with McCain-Feingold, where Strict limits were put on political speech leading up to elections, and the uh, the Congress went ahead and passed it, and the president signed it, uh, only to find that it was unconstitutional. And I always thought it was a black mark on George W. Bush that he basically took that approach, like, I'll just go ahead and take the path of least resistance, sign it, and send it up to the court and let, you know, Roberts and Scalia and company uh, shoot it down if they want to. I don't recall George Bush having uh, such reverence for the Constitution that that, <laughs> that that surprises me, Tim. I agree. Well, finally, let's talk about one more thing, and that's Trump's Labor Department providing clarity on so-called joint employment. Well, the reason why I think this is an important story, Tim, it just continues to illustrate, as we've done from time to time here, about how the regulatory state impacts liberty um, and Trump has generally been uh, aces in this area, I think, uh, removing the restrictions that people have in, in, in order to deal with other people. 
the Obama administration in 2015 um, basically expanded this rule so that more people were liable for the misdeeds of another. So what I mean by that is if you own company A and you do business with company B and maybe you hire out subcontractors through company C, who's in, in charge of making sure that those people's uh, withholdings get taken care of and that sort of thing, right? Well, these things were expanded under the Obama administration because the unions want more people to sue, okay? <laughs> to, and the government wants more people to be able to effectively sue and go after for these things if they're not done right. But if you have massive exposure to this kind of liability as a, a person doing business or a company doing business, what the end result is is that fewer people will be hired and, and less economic activity will take place. Now, that's not necessarily a problem to the unions who have you know, high wages and benefits. But for the least of, of people, encouraging any more employment uh, is, is a good thing. And uh, I think you know, this is part and parcel as to why we are seeing uh, a good economy, Tim. It's, it's these rules that are relaxed or peeled back from uh, their most you know, government-focused to, to business-focused. Okay, thank you, Scott. Thanks, Tim. This program, Liberty Nation Radio and LibertyNation.com's own podcasts, The Uprising, hosted by Scott and The Rabbit Hole, Politics and Prose, where past is prologue, all available at LibertyNation.com and from fine podcast providers everywhere. So that is it for this week, but we'll be back at you next week, same time, same station. Till then, this is Tim Donner saying, stand up for liberty. And we'll see you next time on Liberty Nation Radio.